the slides because the, it doesn't work and the pointer works. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, now it works. My name is Stepan Polyanov. I'm from the University of Oulu and I'm going to talk about the atmospheric cutoff and particularly for its the, uh, altitude profile. So, uh, uh, studying cosmic rays, especially with the neutron monitors, we uh, uh, use the property of locations called the geomagnetic cutoff, and this is the major uh, property of locations. So, we, uh, the Earth magnetic field defines the uh, cutoff values defined by the magnetic field. So. Uh, be as high as 17 gigavolts at the equator region, and uh, the geomagnetic cutoff is almost negligible in the polar regions. And here, at high altitudes, both at the north and the, and the south, uh, the intensity of the cascade of cosmic rays near the ground is defined mainly by, not by, no, the ability to register particles by the cascade, uh, is defined mainly by uh, the atmospheric cutoff value because uh, in the polar region the geomagnetic cutoff is uh, about zero. Okay, and then so I guess you are all familiar with the development of the cosmic ray cascade in the atmosphere where uh, the primary incident particle uh, collides with the ambient atoms of uh, air in air and uh, many sorts of particles are produced. But since we are talking, I'm talking mainly about the application to the neutron monitors, I'm mainly interested in, the, in this hadronic branch. So, uh, and since the neutron monitors are instruments located at the ground, uh, the range of altitudes available for us is something between the sea level to the altitude of about five kilometers. And here you see that the cascade, the cascade gets stronger with the growing altitude. And it means that the atmospheric cutoff gets lower because we have a higher probability to, uh, for particle to hit the instrument. So uh, in this work published uh, last year, me uh, and Alexander Misch, we calculated the uh, atmospheric profile, how the atmospheric cutoff changes with the altitude. And we apply two uh, different approaches, we call like one physical and another one instrumental, let's say. The first one is uh, we use the giant four based planetary cosmic code to simulate the development of the, cas of the cosmic ray cascade in the atmosphere. And we uh, hit the atmosphere with the monoenergetic beams of particles with the vertical and isotropic angular distributions in this range. This range was chosen because uh, we know that, uh, we know one uh, point, uh, the atmospheric cutoff for protons at the sea level is about one uh, gigavolt in rigidity or about 430 mega electron volts in the energy. So, we uh, played around this energy range uh, and we checked the um, intensity of neutrons uh, at the depth from 600 to 1000 grams per square centimeter, which corresponds to the altitudes from zero to almost four kilometers. And the criterion for registration was uh, we need to have at least one secondary neutrons, neutron at this uh, uh, depth to get the cascade registered. And the second approach is so-called the instrumental, where we use the recently published uh, neutron monitor response yield functions for different altitudes. And we define it, uh, we use the realistic spectrum of uh, for galactic cosmic rays, and we set the detection threshold. We derived it from the uh, one reference point, as I told you, that we know the atmospheric cutoff at the uh, the sea level. So, about this physical approach, you see that this is the number of uh, incident secondary protons from from one uh, cascade induced by uh, energy primary proton 
as a function of the energy of this primary proton. So we set this detection threshold and how, this is how we estimated the cutoff. This blue line corresponds to the sea level and the red one corresponds to the about three kilometers of elevation. And so, and we also played with the angular distribution. We took the isotropic and vertical one, but this is more realistic for our case. Uh, and the second instrumental uh, approach is a bit more tricky. Uh, we can theoretically calculate the uh, neutron minor count rate with this integral, where this is the yield function and this is the intensity of cosmic rays. This is just basically the differential spectrum. And we can split this integral with the integration limit, uh, EC, the parameter, which just splits the integral to the main part where most of the counts of the neutron monitor are, and also the low energy reminder. Uh, and we also can normalize this, the uh, reminder part, the low energy part, to the standard uh, deviation, the, to the sigma which can be also found from the total count rate of the neutron monitor since the counts are basically follow the Poisson distribution. And so here, this lower line is the, uh, this reminder integral as a function of this energy uh, integration limit for the sea level. And we know uh, that the atmospheric cutoff is about like this uh, for this altitude. And we said this is as the detection threshold for the neutron monitor. And so using the same threshold, we could find how the cutoff behaves with the different altitudes. These are different curves correspond to different altitudes. And this is the altitude profile for this, uh, for our uh, calculations. So uh, the blue curve is the uh, atmospheric cutoff profile calculated with this uh, physical, with the planetary cosmics. Uh, and here, the red curve is this instrumental uh, uh, way to calculate it. The main difference between these two curves is that the, the blue one assumes that we register every single neutron that arrive. And the red one, the yield function based one, uh, it takes the uh, imperfection of the neutron monitor as a detector uh, into account. That's why it is more conservative. And it provides the higher values of the atmospheric cutoff. Yes, uh, important thing is that uh, nowadays we have uh, only two instruments which have exceptionally high sensitivity to cosmic rays because they are polarly, uh, located in the polar region have uh, z practically zero geomagnetic cutoff, and they are also located at high altitudes. These instruments are the Dome C, Dome B at the Concordia station, and the South Pole neutron monitor at the station Amundsen Scott, basically at the South Pole. And uh, these are the values. Uh, as I told you, the atmospheric cutoff at the sea level is about 430 mega electron volts. And you see that uh, these neutron monitors have uh, the atmospheric cutoff values reduced to 300 uh, MeV. And in the second work published, not yet published, but it's just waiting to be released, the preprint is available. We uh, took all existing, existed, and uh, some proposal, proposed polar neutron monitor stations with the uh, geomagnetic cutoff below one gigavolt. So we assume that the count rates of these instruments are mainly defined by the atmospheric cutoff. And we calculated this curve, the altitude profile, with the instrumental approach, and also calculated these particular uh, values for the stations. Uh, so you see that most of them, most of the polar stations are located here because they are located near the sea level. Here we have this exceptionally sensitive Dome C, Dome B, a South Pole, and also old neutron monitor Vostok, which is not operation in operation anymore, and the proposed station summit at the top of the green, uh, glacier of G Greenland. Uh, so uh, these are these instruments are exceptionally sensitive comparing to the main family of the points here, 
and they can cause the event they are able to register so-called sub-GLE events which are uh, solar energetic particle events with the uh, particles with the about 300 MeV. And there is also the station Sanaya, which is somewhere, somewhere between. It's also quite highly elevated. Uh, and they also have a sensitivity higher than the rest of the polar stations. And uh, now another thing that we tried, these all calculations were done for the conditions when we do not have the solar energetic particle events. It is the condition, so-called this GLE, uh, GCR only scenario, when we have only galactic cosmic rays. But what happens if we assume that, uh, take into account, if we consider, for example, the extreme case, the, if the GLE uh, number five happens. So we did this calculation, the uh, GLE number five from 1956 probably, yes? Uh, it was exceptionally, strong solar energetic particle event and it had two distinguished phases the prompt so-called the prompt component and the delayed component so you see uh, we took some hypothetical neutron monitor at 700 gram per, per square centimeter this is about uh, 2.5 kilometers of alt elevation and we uh, and you see how this reminder integral grows up and this also reduces the uh, atmospheric cutoff significantly to the lower in the lower direction so uh, this is the list of the uh, studied neutron monitors and you see that uh, most almost all of them are at the sea level and their uh, atmospheric cutoff is around 400 uh, but the, during the GLE scenario extreme, this value can drop as, as low as to lower than 300 MeV for the, during the hard prompt component and even lower to 130 MeV during the delayed phase of the GLE. So uh, I want to say that the GLE number five is quite an extreme scenario, is the strongest GLE that we ever observed. So uh, during a moderate GLE, the actual, the effective atmospheric cutoff uh, energy will be somewhere between them, between the 400 and uh, uh, I would say 300. So, and another short motivation for this study was that uh, there were two definitions for the sub-GLE, one's proposed by Oscar Raukin and, and co-authors, and they say that sub-GLE is an event, solar genetic particle event, with the energies around uh, higher than uh, 300 MeV. And we proposed another definition, the observational one, saying that the sub-GLE is the event seen only by high altitude polar neutron monitors, but which is not seen by uh, even polar, but uh, sea level stations. And our calculations show that actually these two definitions, they agree quite well and there is no problem using them together. So, and here is my summary. What we did. We calculated the altitude profile of the effective uh, atmospheric cutoff, how it changes with the altitude. We calculated it for the list of the polar neutron monitors. We show how the uh, effective uh, atm atmospheric cutoff energy reduces with the, during a strong sub-GLE. And we also show that uh, actually two sub-GLE definitions they are by Raukonen and Polyanov, they don't contradict with each other. So they agree quite well. And this is actually all what I was going to say. Thank you. <laughs>